conflict. Ever since we've had people, we've had conflict. So, since, like, forever. Throughout history, people have solved their issues in all kinds of ways. Like sword fights, which are kind of cool, or jousts, which are kind of crazy. And while the arena has changed, conflict is still happening today. At school, at home, and online. But we can fight the right way, where both sides win. On the battlefield. When I was in high school, one of the things I looked forward to all year long was summer camp. I mean, every summer, I went to a week-long church camp, and uh, even though I didn't really care a whole lot about my relationship with God at that age, I loved going to camp. It was one of the highlights of my summer. And the summer after my sophomore year, I had a scheduling conflict, and I couldn't make it to the week of camp that my student youth group was going to, and I was so bummed. But my mom, and she was trying to be nice, she said, why don't you find a week that you can go and I'll take you? <laughs> and I agreed. And my mom drove me down there and we rented this little hotel room and I bought a ticket and I went to all the sessions at camp. <laughs> and it was awful. Okay? For some reason, it just it never struck me that one of the reasons I loved camp so much was because I was there with my friends from church. And now I was at camp with my mom, not quite as exciting, and that week of camp for me was miserable. I met a few people, but we really didn't have much in common. And they were nice because I, you know, I was the poor little guy who went to camp with his mommy. But I realized the camp for me, it just wasn't the same without my friends around. Now on a bigger scale, I'd venture to say that life just isn't life without friends around. And if you're struggling to have friends right now, let me just say, I get it. Because if no one remembers your birthday, it's just not quite as cool to turn 16. If you showed up at youth group and you were the only person there, or you went to a small group and sat in the room by yourself, you know, youth group wouldn't be quite as fun, would it? See, because relationships simply make things better. But isn't it true that the same relationships that make life so much fun can also be very difficult at times. I mean, you get close enough to somebody and there's going to be conflict. Your parents and step-parents, your teachers and coaches, your siblings and step-siblings, your friends and best friends, they are the people you're most likely gonna have conflict with because they are the people who are closest to your life. That's just the reality. But there's a lie out there that says in a good relationship with your parents or siblings or friends that there won't be any fighting. You're never going to find yourself in a battlefield. Well, I just don't believe that. In fact, I don't think conflict has to destroy our relationships. If you get close enough to somebody, there's going to be conflict. I believe it's our response to conflict is what destroys relationships. It's how we handle the conflict that turns negative. The problem is, even if we know the right thing to do when a fight breaks out, actually doing the right thing is a challenge. And I'm not talking about a fight where, you know, two guys start punching each other in the face in the Wendy's parking lot. I'm talking about an argument that involves you and your best friend, your stepmom, your geometry teacher, someone in your student ministry, a member of the opposite sex, your little sister, a person at your school who gossips a lot, you know, all those types of people. Now, think about the last big fight you had. What were you fighting about? I mean, maybe your parents wouldn't let you go to a concert and that all your friends were going to, or maybe your best friend invited everyone to her house to hang out except you. Or maybe your girlfriend feels like you're spending more time playing video games with your friends than you are with her, whatever. Conflict is around us. And in that moment, there's no manual that says, here's how you perfectly handle this situation. No, you're left to deal with it on your own the best way you know how. And that means you probably deal with it in one of two ways. One, it's the way that has been modeled to you. Basically, you deal with battles the way your family does. Even if you've never thought about it, there's a good chance that you respond to arguments or conflicts the same way one of your parents or step-parents do. The second way we deal with conflict is the same way as the person on the other side of the battle line. See, however they act, 
That's probably how you're gonna act. If they yell, you yell. If they get sarcastic, you get sarcastic. If they take the fight to social media, then you will too. See, no matter what the fight was about, and no matter which way you chose to respond, I'd venture to say that at the end of the day, you probably thought you were right, and the other person was wrong. See, everyone else got to go to that concert, and because of that, you concluded that you were right and your parents were wrong. Your best friend should have invited you to hang out, and because she didn't, you were right and she was wrong. The reality is that when it comes to conflicts in our lives, we love to be right. We're fighting to prove we're right, to prove our point. And usually the point we're making seems so obvious to us. Points like this, he's overbearing, or she shouldn't have done that, and he doesn't listen to my side of the story. The problem is, the more we fight to be right or prove we're right, the more our relationships will suffer. And after we've made our point, even if we do end up convincing someone that we're right, we're left with nothing but pain and regret and confusion. So what do we do about it? Well, the good news is if you really get what we're talking about today, it'll set you up to change the way you view fighting and conflict forever. The Apostle Paul, who's like the LeBron James of Christianity, wrote a letter to a church in a town called Ephesus. The church in Ephesus was having a hard time getting along. Not because they were bad people, but because sometimes it's just hard to get along with people. We all get that. And in a section where Paul addresses their conduct or their behavior, he talks about how to handle conflict. And the thing that I love here is that even though Paul is writing to Christians and he uses a Christian kind of language, what he says matters to all people. Everyone, whether a Christian or not, can benefit from what he says. He says this, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. See, the first thing Paul says is make every effort. See, giving all our effort isn't the problem. It's just that we usually put all of our effort toward winning the argument, toward making a point, toward being right, not toward peace. But Paul speaks something different about throwing all of our effort into something different. So what are we making an effort to do? To keep the unity of the Spirit. And unity may not seem like a big deal, but it really is. Being unified creates stronger relationships and healthier people. Constantly being at odds with the people around us only makes us weaker and overly defensive and generally unhappier. Paul is saying instead of fighting against a person, we need to be fighting for peace. In fact, Paul says it's through the bond of peace that we keep peace, that we keep unity. In a world that loves conflict, we need to be people who choose something different, something unique, something that can only be traced back to God himself. See, conflict comes down to wanting our own way. One guy says, dude, I saw you flirting with that girl that I like. The other says, dude, you're not even official yet. <laughs> one, one girl denies talking behind her back. The other one has hurt feelings. You want to go to a concert. Your stepdad thinks it's a bad idea or unsafe. You, you tell your little sister, I need to watch The Voice. And she says, I need to watch Doc McStuffins. <laughs> and in that moment, you want to get your way. You think you're right. And so you fight to be right. You say hurtful stuff. And if they win or get the upper hand or hurt you more, you want revenge. So you keep score instead of keeping the unity of the Spirit. And Paul introduces a new way of approaching a battlefield. For you, it starts with a question you can ask yourself when a fight breaks out. Am I fighting to be right or am I fighting for the relationship? That's a great question. Here's another way to ask it. Am I choosing to get back at someone or am I choosing the peace for our friendship? See, conflict will happen, but some of you need to start choosing different responses. I've seen friendships end. I've seen siblings who could really help each other and be there for each other actually destroy each other. I've seen parents or step-parents and, and, and their teenagers enter into a world of bitterness that I don't think either one really wants. And it's usually over something that in the long run isn't that big of a deal. It's because they made the goal winning the argument 
instead of the goal winning the relationship. This is where we need to allow scripture to shape our responses. So let's go back to that main verse. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to approach conflict different than everyone else. See, the Spirit of God is one that, above everything else, guides us to assign value to people by loving them, even people who are different than us, even people who will never agree with us. God cares about unity and peace in our relationships. And because of that, he is leading us as his followers to choose peace with a person over winning an argument. Here's the bottom line. Making peace is greater than making a point. And if you decided today that you agree that loving a person is better and more important than making a point, then there are some things you can do the next time you face conflict. First, think about you. Okay, when you're in the middle of conflict, you have to remind yourself, I'm valuable. I don't need to win this argument to feel more important. I already am. And if they win, I won't be any less valuable. Based on your value, a great next question is, how can I react in a humble way? How can I practice being humble or treating others better than myself for the sake of the relationship? And how can I make an effort to keep peace and make peace? Then, another great thing to do is think about them. In the same way that you have to remember that you're valuable, you must remember they're valuable. Your little sister is valuable. So is your best friend and your biology teacher and your stepmom and the person at your school who gossips a lot. They're valuable. And because of that, your question is, how can I treat them in a way that shows that they're valuable? How can I talk to them in a way that communicates? Even if I disagree with you, I think you're a valuable person. As we close, I want you to think about this. What if you were right all the time? I mean, what if you made your point regardless of what it meant to other people? Then what? What would have happened? Would it make you more popular at school? Would you be voted most right in your yearbook? Would you get into a great college because you won all of your arguments? Would people sign your yearbook and say, wow, I love being in school with you. You made people feel so stupid when they disagreed with you. You're the coolest guy ever. You never let things drop until you get your way. Congratulations. Guys, would girls want to date you more? Oh, when he argues with his stepmom, he's such a jerk, but he wins every time. He's just so attractive when he makes her feel worthless. Ladies, would... The guys line up to ask you on dates because you successfully destroyed all the relationships in your home, all out of revenge. Okay, that's crazy. But that's how many people are living their high school lives. And in the end, you may make a point, but your life won't be better. And you'll miss the very thing Paul urges you to do in your relationships. That particularly when conflict shows up, we got to remember, making peace is greater than making a point.